Now this is Radio TV Phono Nut, and I just found something interesting on AM. Are talking about coaching decisions, even though he's Make you weak. You'll cry. Now that's pretty impressive. Hadn't heard, heard music like that on AM around here in 35 years. But it's not coming from a commercial AM station. It's coming from this General Electric wireless record player from about 1938-39. So let's go along on the on the journey to fixing this, shall we? This is Radio TV Phono Nut, and here's a General Electric wireless 78 RPM record player from the late 30s. These were designed to transmit the audio from records to a nearby AM radio, and these were very popular for use with sets that either had no built-in phonograph or had no... Uh, no input jack for a wired phonograph attachment. And this is your all phone and volume control, or in this case, modulation control. And this jack is for plugging in a crystal microphone, a high output crystal microphone, so you can broadcast your voice to a nearby radio, sing along to your favorite records, I suppose. Here's the schematic diagram, not much to it. They are obtaining the B plus directly off of the AC power line, and to get the filament voltage for the 12A7 tube, there's a tap on the motor winding. Half of the 12A7 tube serves as a half wave rectifier for the to obtain the necessary DC operating voltage, and the other half of the 12A7 serves as an oscillator and modulator for the transmission of the. Uh, music music or whatever from the records that you're playing. This uses a crystal cartridge which would have to be a high output type in the three to four volt range since there's no preamp stage and it comes off of the audio, comes off of the center of the volume control and goes up here and modulates the screen grid of the 12A7 and then we have a loop antenna wired in parallel. It's actually wired in parallel with a tremor capacitor that sets your transmit frequency. And like I said, it's pretty simple. Now I can tell that someone has previously worked on this because that's obviously not the original cartridge. If that's a Fansteel P51-3, and it certainly looks like one, that cartridge is only good for about Oh, around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts, so that's not going to be hot enough to do much good for this transmitter. You may get a little output, a little modulation, but it won't be very good. And I seem to remember plugging this in several years ago when I got this and couldn't get a, couldn't pick up the carrier frequency on a radio, but as you can tell by the looks of this power cord, it's not too safe to plug in now so we need to change the power cord before we do anything. Here's the underside. This is the big loop antenna that serves a dual purpose. It makes up the oscillator coil and it also radiates the uh, carrier frequency. This is the phono motor. Looks like a direct drive job. Here's the little one tube transmitter chassis. Let's take it out and see what we have underneath. Here's the underside of the chassis. It looks like an electrolytic has been replaced, but everything else looks original. We have a couple of these big molded, looks like mica bomb capacitors that are probably leaky as all get out by now. All right, I replaced the power cord, and let's turn it on and see what happens. 
Well, it sounds like the mother is frozen for one thing. Yeah, there it goes. Let it warm up and see if I can tune in a carrier here. Here's the old record that was on it when I got it. Some beat up, scratchy something or another. Okay, we're getting a little something. Very touchy. Just barely getting something. A lot of that I think is due to that low output cartridge, but I still think we should get a little more than what we were getting. Okay, and looking at those two molded capacitors, C4 and C5, C4 appears to be just an isolation cap to isolate the signal ground, as in the cartridge and the microphone jack from the uh, B minus circuit ground here. And that's nice that they thought about that. At least you won't get killed. You might get shocked, but you shouldn't get killed with that in there. And C5 connects between the plate and cathode of the rectifier. I think that's probably some kind of RF suppression. And I could see if that cap goes leaky, we could have all kind of squealing and crap going on so we'll just go ahead and change those like I said we know they're probably leaky as all get out anyway alright I will place that one capacitor in the uh, power supply let it warm up and yeah I believe we have a carrier now yeah we're just barely getting something And I think that's just because that cartridge is not hot enough. Okay, here's the safety capacitor for the uh, isolation. I don't like doing them this way, but these particular safety caps have little short stubby leads for PC board mounting, so I had no choice but to do it like this. And on the schematic, there's a 220K ohm resistor across the cartridge that somebody eliminated. I suspect they did that to try to get a little bit more more gain out of this to compensate for the lower output cartridge although I think this cartridge is much too low like I've already said Okay, I have the cartridge connected to my AC voltmeter just to see what we get while our record's playing. And the highest reading I'm getting is about 0 0.2 volts, so I think that cartridge is probably bad anyway. And yeah, that's exactly what they did. They just hot glued the old cartridge in here and soldered the wires directly to the terminals, which is a no-no. That right there might have been what actually killed this thing. 
Okay, this cartridge is indeed a Varco. It's an older one, but it looks just like the current issue Fan Steel P51 series cartridges. The only difference is these older Varco cartridges are 3 volt output, where the uh, newer ones are something like 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts. Uh, just for testing purposes, I have this old 1970s era aesthetic school record player tone arm that I borrowed off of a school record player that I'm probably going to part out and it uses the Aesthetic 89T cartridge I'm going to stick this one in stick this arm on this record player just for testing and see what it does and if we have good enough results then we can try to modify an Aesthetic 89T to this old arm or I find another arm that's more period correct looking, but uh, I really don't think this uh, 1970 school record player arm is very period correct for a late 30s phonograph. Alright, I'm getting a little bit better results, but not nearly what I anticipated, even with a 1.3 volt cartridge. I would expect better than this. Alright, that's better. My ground wire had came loose that I just had tack soldered on. But yeah, that's better. A world I never so yeah, I think we can get away with using an 89, 89T cartridge in this thing. Just for fun, let's hear what some mumble rap sounds like at 78 RPM. As far as the range of this, it's not going to be that great. Maybe, maybe if you're lucky, 15 to 20 feet. You know, these were not meant to be high power. They were meant to be to uh, transmit to a radio within the same room as the uh, record player is placed. So we'll come back out here tomorrow and try this again in the daytime where there's not so much interference from distant radio stations and see how it does. Alright, attention AM radio stations. They like to crank your modulation all the way up to max. Remember, more is not always better. That's more like what it should sound like, but this is what y'all sound like. That's the overmodulated gospel station. As you can hear, they both sound about the same. Okay, so now all I need to do is tie up some loose ends on the amp, or on the transmitter chassis, rather. Do a little service on this motor, and by the way, I, I like this direct drive motor. Even though it could stand to be lubricated, it's much quieter than the ones they came out with 
after this one that use an idler wheel. And then we need to figure out a way to mount an 89T cartridge to this tone arm. Now, if this still had the original cartridge in it, which I believe originally just uh, recessed down in this little hole here, this little slot, and then there was a cover plate that went over here that held the cartridge in place. If I still had that cartridge, I'd be inclined to send it off and have it rebuilt since this is a bit of a rare piece here and I'd want to try to keep it as original as possible but since we don't have the original cartridge I'm either going to have to find a way to mount an 89T into this one or find a junk 78 player with a period correct tone arm that has a provision for a counterbalance spring on it so I can get the tracking pressure down Okay, back on the GE wireless record player. I was going to do a little basic service to the motor, but on this particular one, there's not a whole lot you can do to it. The only thing you can remove is this back cover here. And pretty much all I did was this hole right here. I hosed that out with contact cleaner and then filled it full of oil and I put a little bit of oil around the spindle and let it soak down in there and that's about all I can do to this. It seems to be running good and it's quiet. In fact this type of motor is quieter than the uh, rim drive motors that replace these. Got good spin down time, so yeah, I think I've done about all I can do to this motor. And I'm going to put a dab of dab of our phono lube right here on the end of this shaft where it makes contact with this little dot right here, this little bump here on the cover, just to be on the safe side and put it back together. And that's about all I can do with this. All right, we got it back together. There's still a little bit of noise transmission from the motor to the record player cabinet. And that's because the rubber grommets are 80 years old and not in the best of shape. But there's some oddball type that we don't have and don't know if I can get. So I'm just making the best of them. They're not turned to powder. They're still pliable. They're just kind of deformed looking. And after all, this is not a high fidelity turntable. This is for playing, <laughs> transmitting low fi 78 RPM records to a nearby AM radio. So it's not like this is going to be high fidelity. Now all we have to do is come up with a suitable cartridge for the tone arm, and this thing ought to be back in business. Okay, I come up with something that might be a viable solution here. I took one of the tall half inch mount brackets and I had to sand down each side of it to get it to wedge down in here and then I broke off the uh, front and back mounting tabs where you would normally clip a Varco or Chio Denshi cartridge in it and then flipped it upside down and I'm going to take some JB Weld and JB Weld it to the tone arm to make sure it doesn't fall out. Then we have this cartridge here. This come out of some cheap kitty record player. It's a high output crystal cartridge. And according to my voltmeter, it still has output. I think this is an LP needle, so I'm going to have to swap it out for a 78 needle. And then we can JB weld this to the that bracket, and then it ought to be good to go. Now, I really don't like... JB welding cartridges in place like that because if it fails and has to be replaced it might make it a little difficult to remove but you know it is what it is if I had the original cartridge that came in this tone arm I'd just have it rebuilt but I don't so we're just going to have to make this work the best way possible okay I have the donor cartridge attached it's kind of sloppy looking but it's in there and given that I didn't have the original cartridge, it's the best I could do. And I have it connected to my AC voltmeter. And, when you, and you can see when I 
rake my finger across the needle, we got plenty of output. It's jumping up to over four volts in some instances, so this thing ought to ought to do it. All right, let's install the tone arm back on the machine and give it a try. Oh yes, and I also replaced the one mil LP tip that was on this cartridge with a three mil tip off of a, an old dead cartridge. The needle was still good, or at least I think it's a three mil tip. I'm about to the point I really don't care what it is as long as it reproduces the record. That's all I'm worried about. It's not like this is something that's going to be used every day or used for serious listening. Alright, that's it. Okay, I can tell our oil has seeped its way around into the motor gearbox and all that after sitting overnight. It's quieter today. All I'm hearing now is the vibrations of the motor making its way to the cabinet here, which is normal. But yeah, I think this thing's about done.